Hey everyone, Madrybred here. Pokemon Platinum with only one Chansey was a brutal solo run. Let's follow that up with another team run. Today's the day that we figure out would I be able to beat Pokemon Black with only HM moves? So this is going to be a rough one for a few reasons. On screen, you can see the game's HM list. Not only are there less HMs than in some of the other games, but would you look at where we get them? Yeah, we get cut just after the first gym, and that's nice, but then we don't get the first non-normal type HM until after the ground gym. That's the fifth gym of the game, meaning about a third of this entire challenge is going to be done only with the move cut, a 50 power normal move with a 5% chance of missing, and then after that we get strength. That means that we just have to grind a lot, and grinding is extra hard in Generation 5 because you get diminishing returns. You get far less experience for fighting Pokémon that are above your level in this game. In normal gameplay, that would encourage strategy, but in challenge runs, it just causes more pain. Let's hope for the best. Like always, I'm writing this script as I go through with the challenge, so all of this part is being written before I've started. Everyone comment down below and guess if I can win or not. I'm pretty sure that I can win, but I think the whole first half of this run is going to be brutal. Really, I don't see things getting much easier until we get Surf, and that's not until after we beat six gyms. Let's explain the rules. In combat, I can only use HM moves. No glitches or exploits, no items in battle, only Pokeballs, held items, and items outside of combat are allowed. Also, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for more. Let's do this. No need for the Pokemon randomizer for this one. For starters, I went with Oshawott, partly because it's a good Pokemon in general, partly because it learns Cut early on, and mostly because most of the best HMs are water moves and this is the water starter, so it just makes sense. Now, we can't actually get the Cut HM until right after the first gym, so the first couple of routes in the game we just have to fight normally. It's honestly not that big a deal though, these fights are super easy in every run, so we're not really missing out on anything that could have stopped us. Let's just go grab Cut and start the challenge. As soon as we get Cut and we go to leave the town, we have a fight with Charon. We have a Dewat by this point, so the first part of the fight went alright. We did take a few Leers and a Vine Whip that really hurt us, but we did just enough damage to get the knockout. I had to switch to a Panseer to fight Purloin due to the defense drops, but it naturally didn't last long and we had to tag back to Dewat to finish it off. That didn't go great, but considering we were fighting a grass type with a water type at the start, it wasn't bad. Hey, it's time to catch a few new Pokemon. First here on Route 3, we can get Pidove. We can't use it until we have Fly much later in the run, but eventually it evolves into Unpheasant, who is one of the best flying types in the game. As soon as we get to the Wellspring Cave, I hunt around for Dust Clouds to get a Drillbur. Now, we can't really use any of its cool ground moves, but we can learn both Cut and Strength, and once it evolves, it gets insane attack, so I figure it'll probably be worth catching. Plus, it becomes part Steel-type when it evolves, and Steel resists a lot, so I could probably use that as a tank if I have to. It took almost an entire hour, by the way. Hunting for dust clouds sucks. Also, before going to the normal gym, I picked up Time Pole from near the Pinwheel Forest. We won't be able to use him for quite a while since it doesn't learn Cut, but it'll make for a good water type later in the run if we end up needing another one. Next up is N. He always uses local Pokemon, and honestly, nothing local here is that dangerous, so we didn't have that hard a time, but Drill Bird did go down. In fact, Drillbur tends to go down in just about every trainer fight that we do. Considering how tanky the normal gym leader's Pokemon are, I think I'm going to have to grind him up to at least level 20. Something tells me this might be our first brick wall of the run, but we'll see. Okay, so things start badly. Even with a lucky crit, Herdier was easily able to take down Drillbur, and thanks to a super potion, she even had a chance to deal some decent damage to Dewat. Since she has Intimidate, no matter who I send out first, we'll have a hard time getting her to faint quickly. Second was Watchhog, who hardly took any damage before knocking us out. Yeah, I think it's time to grind. So, the best place to grind is right here by the nurse near the start of the Pinwheel Forest. It's pretty slow, but at least it's really quick to heal back up. Sometimes I can luck out and find an Audino in the Shaking Grass, but thanks to us being such a higher level than them, they only give us about a quarter of a level worth of experience, so it doesn't really help that much. Not gonna lie, this has me pretty worried about the rest of the run. 
If we're having this much trouble using cut on the second gym, how hard is it going to be on the third, fourth, and fifth gyms? I mean, the fifth gym even has a steel type that we have to fight. That's going to be really rough. At least we can get strength before the fourth gym, but it's still normal type, so it doesn't really save us from rock and steel types. Let's hope that this goes better than I expected. Okay, so this next attempt is hilarious. We're only a few levels higher, and by all accounts, we should easily lose. And yet, for whatever baffling reason, they just used Leer the entire fight? And I really do mean the entire fight. The only time that they used a move that wasn't Leer was Hypnosis, and it missed. So naturally, we took no damage. Why did they even do that? Okay, well, next is the Pinwheel Force, and thankfully this area is where we're finally able to make some good progress. We're overleveled enough that Cut deals with most things in one or two hits. You know, you guys have been telling me forever to just use the option in the Pokemon randomizer to change the Gen 5 experience system back to the normal one that every other game uses, and I'm not gonna lie, it's tempting. It would mean that I could do Gen 5 challenges more often, since the main thing that stops me is just how much slower they are, especially in multi-Pokemon runs like this. See, because we're doing a challenge, that means we have a handicap that the AI doesn't, and we often have to be a higher level than them the entire game to compensate. That, or we're using one Pokemon, and so they get all of the experience, and they can't help but be a higher level than whatever we're fighting. Problem is, in Gen 5, if you're a higher level than your opponent, then you actually get less experience. Like, they lower the number of experience points you get per battle. So basically, that means I just get less experience from nearly every fight I do the entire game. And these runs already take a long time as is. The Pokemon Randomizer lets you change that back to the normal Pokemon experience system, but I'm gonna leave that up to you guys on if I do that or not. Let me know if you want me to use that from now on or not in the comments section. For this run, it's regular Gen 5 experience system. Now, let's go see if we can handle the Bug Gym. So, this Bug Gym battle goes terribly. First is Whirlipede, who should be easy, but thanks to two Hyper Potions, manages to hang on for so long that we actually lose Dewat. We can take it down, but then we have to deal with Levani, who's part Grass type and can nearly one-shot us with Razor Leaf so we really don't stand a chance. If I remember right, there's a rock type after that too, so I get the feeling that we're going to be brick-walled here for a long while. So it's back to the grind, this time north of town. I could grind in the Pinwheel Forest, but honestly that's probably slower than grinding here. Hard to say though because of the weather effect. I really wish we could cross the desert since the HM for strength is on the other side, but we still have the Bug Gym and two rival fights between us and there. I doubt the rival fight will be as hard as this Bug Gym though, so I think that as long as we can get past it, we'll be fine. After a decently long grind, we finally get Drillbur to evolve into Exadrill, and that got us a pretty huge jump in attack. Maybe I can win this now. Things were much different this time, with us absolutely decimating his first two Pokémon. Dewebble took a little bit longer to take down thanks to being part Rock-type, and I had to switch at one point to deal with the Sand Attacks, but we were in no real danger. It's crazy how much evolving one Pokémon can make a difference. Now we've got two rival fights to do. First is Bianca. She was super easy. She managed to knock out Exadrill, but it was just a lucky crit with a fire move. The whole rest of her team went down just fine. Next was Charon, who was even easier. They couldn't even take Exadrill down to half health. It's so nice to have a fast chunk of the game again, and I'm really hoping that the fact that Exadrill is part ground will mean that the normally brutal Electric Gym will be easy. That said, I know they have some fire moves, so we'll see when we get there. Once we get to Nimbasa City, I head straight for the HM for strength. It's still normal type, and it's not that amazing, but it's a straight up upgrade from Cut. Dewat can't learn it, but Drillbur can, so at least that's something. I hope that it's enough to get past N. This upcoming N fight is usually a hard one. Yep, strength was absolutely enough, as we one-shot most of his team. I'm so happy I spent an hour catching Drillbur. This thing is incredible. Electric Gym time. Okay, this one we absolutely should have lost due to the insane amount of times that we lost turns to Paralysis, and the fact that Static paralyzed us on the very first round, but we actually won just because Zebstrika used Quick Attack rather than Flame Charge on one of its turns. 
seriously, if it just used Flame Charge one more time, then we easily would have fainted, and there's no way that Dewat would have survived an electric gym. You're a gym leader, how did you even make that mistake? Oh, and on our way out of town, we had another Charon fight where we took, like, four damage. Look, I'm just trying to savor how nice this is while it lasts, because we both know I'll be hitting a brick wall before we know it. On our way over the bridge, I go ahead and catch a Ducklet. I figure that having Swana on the team will be pretty useful considering it can learn tons of HMs. I'm not sure how much we're gonna get out of it, but we may as well have it. Right, so while I go through the cold storage, let's talk about the upcoming parts of the run. We have the ground gym next, and I think that's gonna be the first real challenge since we got this Exadrill. After that is Bianca, who probably won't be bad, but beating her will get us the HM for Fly. As nice as it's gonna be to finally have a new move, Pidove is from the start of the game and Ducklet just isn't that amazing yet, so I'm gonna have to level them up with experience share before they can really pull their own weight. That said, I'm not gonna complain about getting a new move. I'm gonna have to invest in leveling them up fast though, since the only thing between getting Fly and Celestial Tower is Charged Stone Cave and another end fight. Celestial Tower has mandatory ghost fights, so we'll need Fly to win those. Ground Gym time. It started awesome with us totally obliterating the first two Pokemon on his team, but that's about when the fun stops. Last was his Exadrill, and despite him being a lower level than us, he has much better moves. He could two-shot us, and we couldn't come close to two-shotting him. We can't get a stronger move than Strength, and we can't get a stronger Pokemon than Exadrill, so I'm gonna have to grind and come back. A few levels later, and we actually got an early win thanks to a critical hit. I'm gonna be honest, I really didn't think we'd win that one. <laughs> we probably shouldn't have won that one. Time for Bianca. Her deer was a super easy way to start the fight, though she kept it up for a while with Hyper Potions, and for Pansage, I switched to Dewat, then switched back to undo the attack loss from Intimidate at the start of the fight. It went down super easy. For Pignite, I sent Dewat back in, and we actually took quite a bit of damage from Takedown, but we still got the knockout. Last was Masharna, who we easily overpowered with Exadrill. For winning that fight, we get Fly! Finally, a new move. Next up is Charge Stone Cave. This place isn't too bad to navigate, though, and it's actually a decent place to get some last-minute experience for Tranquil. We have an end fight at the end of this place, then we have to do Celestial Tower, beat the Flying Gym, and I doubt that'll be hard, and then another Charon fight. That Charon fight is important, because right after that we get Surf, and that'll mean Dewat can finally start pulling his weight again. Strength, Fly, and Surf will be our best moves this whole run. I guess I could start leveling Time Pull as soon as we get Surf, but at the same time, I'm not really sure it's worth it yet. If I can get away with beating the whole game with less than 6 Pokemon, then I should. The less Pokemon I can win with, the less grinding I need to do to level them all up after all. Time for N, and this was a bit of a rough one. First was Bulldore, who used Iron Defense, but we lucked out and crit to bypass it for a much faster knockout than expected. Joltik was a one-shot, and next was Ferroseed. Now, it couldn't hit us that hard, but thanks to having Iron Barbs and Iron Defense, we took quite a bit of damage on recoil. Last was Clink, who we overpowered in two hits. So, the Celestial Tower is actually an area that I was worried about. It's the first part of the run with required ghost fights, so I had to make sure that Tranquil was strong enough to handle it. But it turns out, it was really easy. Despite being about the same level as what we were fighting, Fly was dealing tons of damage and they weren't really fighting back that much. That's perfect, let's go do the Flying Gym. Well, the Flying Gym ended up being super easy. Exadrill just demolished them with strength. I know this is really becoming the Exadrill run, but to be honest, every HM in this game is just some bland attacking move, so it was pretty much doomed to become this at some point. Hey, we're only one battle away from getting Surf, though. That means I can start leveling up Dewat again. Finally, we have another Charon fight. It goes pretty easily, although he was able to deal tons of damage with grass moves. That aside, we still took his whole team down without switching, and that nets us the HM for Surf. Now, we lucked out on it being winter, so Twist Mountain is much faster than it usually is. See, if there's no snow, then you actually have to go through most of this place, but if it's winter, then you can just walk down the snowbanks and get through this place in probably less than half the time. That said, you still need to know the way to go, and I tend to get lost a lot here. Ice Gym is next, though, and I think that'll go okay. Now, the Ice Gym actually was pretty hilarious, because the only reason it was so easy was their own fault. They used Swagger on us to power up our attack, 
making attacks that absolutely wouldn't be one-shots into one-shots. I guess he thought confusion would really be helpful, but it just sealed his own fate. Okay, we're in the last travel-heavy part of the game. First is the Dragon Spiral Tower, where we have tons of Team Plasma grunts to fight. I tried to level up Dewad a bit, but he just fainted pretty much right away, so I think I'll have to grind him up a bit somewhere else first. I've been using an experience share for a long time to try and get our flying types to level up a bit, and honestly it's looking like I won't be using time pull anytime soon, considering how much the other members of the team already need experience. I'm gonna be honest, I'm pretty worried that the Elite Four is gonna be a brick wall. While I was in Relic Castle to continue the plot, I made sure to pick up the Plume Fossil. This gets us a pretty awesome flying type that I don't know for sure if I'll bother grinding and leveling up, but that it really wouldn't hurt to bring along. It's funny, the hiker said that the Pokemon can't fly, but like, that's literally not true. It can learn the move fly, and thus it can fly. You just need to evolve it first. Now let's go do the last Bianca fight. First was Stoutland, so our attack is down from Intimidate. We overpowered her pretty easily though, and then switched to Samurott for Embor. Surf did an awesome job of taking him to a sliver as she spammed full restore over and over until we finally got the knockout. For Simisage, I sent an Unpheasant, and we actually got a one-shot. Last was Masharna, so I sent Exadrill back in to overpower it with a couple of hits of strength. Okay, two fights left before we're at the Elite Four. We've got the Dragon Gem and the last Charon fight. Now, I'm not really worried about the Charon fight, but the Dragon Gem has me at least a little bit concerned. If Exadrill isn't able to take it out on his own, then we're in trouble, because water moves are going to be resisted, and our fly users just aren't that strong yet. Unfezen can probably deal some great damage, but I don't see him lasting more than a couple of hits before fainting, so I'm trying to level up Archon as much as I can with Experience Share, since once it evolves, it can learn Fly and has a base attack of 140, so slightly higher than Exadrill. Not only that, but it has a brave nature, so more attack and less speed. Considering Fly is stronger than Strength and it'll have the same type attack bonus, Archeops could actually take over for our heaviest hitter on our team by the time of the Elite Four. He does have an ability where his stats are lower when his health is half or lower though, so could be a pain. First up at the Dragon Gym was Fracture, who never actually landed a hit. I was worried his Dragon Dance would make him faster, but nope. We lucked out though and got him to use all of his Hyper Potions right away. Second was Drudagon, who used Dragon Tail to force us to switch to Samurott. I thought we'd faint for sure, but three hits of Surf actually finished him off. Last was Haxorus, and although his Dragon Dance made him faster than us, he just used Dragon Dance again, so we finished him off. I can't believe how easy that was. Okay, last Charon battle. Unpheasant was no match for our Exadrill, and second was Simipore, who literally just used Leer instead of any water moves, so it went down just fine too. For Superior, I sent in our own Unpheasant. He did decent damage to us with Slam, but we still just got the win in two hits of Fly. Last was Lipart, who we just overpowered with Exadrill. That was the last of the rival fights. So we're in the final stretch before the last six fights of the game, Victory Road. While I was here, I made sure to level up quite a bit by the Doctor near the top. I've got to make sure that our flying types are strong enough to handle the Ghost Trainer by themselves, since Exadrill can't hit them. I'm honestly not that worried overall, but I think that investing more in Samurott to handle the Steel types might help since they're resisted by flying and normal. Still, Archeops can probably handle the fighting types as long as his speed isn't too low. Archeops and Unpheasant should be able to take on the Ghosts, and Exadrill can probably brute force through the rest of them. As for N and Getsus at the end of the game though, uh, you never know how that's gonna go. Those fights are usually pretty hard. Now that we're at the Elite Four, let's take a look at our team. You know what? I'm actually not too worried. I've got the team up to level 50 pretty quickly, with a lucky egg and some grinding in Victory Road, and our stats aren't half bad. Yeah, our moves suck, but raw power might get us through a lot of this. I don't like that Archeops has an ability that lowers his stats when below half health, and it sucks that two of our flying types have natures that make them slower, but they both also have extra attack, and that's what I need most anyway. I think that this might go pretty well. Make your final guesses on if we can win this or not. Let's do this. First is Ghost Trainer Chantel. Cofagrigus was first, and we actually got rid of our terrible ability on Archeops by hitting it. It didn't really matter though, they never landed a hit on us. Jellicent was second, and although we hit it hard, Surf one-shot us. I should've used something else. I had Swan to finish it off just fine. 
third was Chandelure, so I had Samurott use Surf and nearly got a one-shot. That meant she was using full restores, though. In the end, her second Shadow Ball made us faint, so I had to send in Swana to finish it off, but it nearly made him faint too. Last was Golurk, so I had Swana stay in to use Surf, then got finished off by Shadow Punch. We had to send Unpheasant in to finish it off since it was our last Pokemon that could hit ghosts. That was closer than I expected. Second is Dark Trainer Grimsley. First was Scrafty, so I had Unpheasant hit Fly for tons of damage. Problem is, he healed and then kept spamming Sand Attack, so our accuracy was terrible. I ended up eventually having to switch to Swanna just to finish it off, although Swanna almost fainted in the process. For Crocodile, I sent in Exadrill, but we lost attack to Intimidate and didn't do much, while his Earthquake nearly one-shot us. We went down, I should have just used Samurott. He was able to finish it off pretty easily after taking a big Earthquake. Next was Basharp, and we had no great answer, so I just used Surf. His Night Slash didn't finish us, so our next Surf was able to get the win. Last was Lipard, so I just sent in Archeops to overpower it and finish it off, but she used Attract on us, and we were immobilized for so long that we weren't able to get a single attack in before fainting. Luckily, Unpheasant is female, so we were able to use Fly with that, although we took damage in the process. That was a weirdly difficult fight. Third is Psychic Trainer Caitlyn. Now, her first Pokémon actually has moves that can nearly one-shot our entire team, thanks to having both Thunder and Focused Blast, and we did lose on plenty of attempts. So after tons of trial and error, I actually found that using Samurott to spam Surf is the best way to not faint. And on this try, Thunder just missed a bunch. For Gothitelle, I sent in Exadrill to spam Strength. It went great, as even with Calm Mind, Psychic didn't take us down. Sigilith was next, and I just kept using Strength and Cut. We almost got the knockout, but she used a full restore just for us to luck out and crit for a one-shot right after. Last was Masharna, so I had Exadrill hit a weirdly weak strength before fainting, then sent in Unpheasant to spam Fly. We took massive damage off Psychic and ended up fainting due to her holding on even longer with full restores, so I had to send in Archeops. It almost went down too, but eventually we got the win. Fourth is Fighting Trainer Marshall. First was Throw, who we actually just one-shot with Fly from Archeops. Second was Sock, who would have been a one-shot the same way, but he had the ability Sturdy to keep him from being a one-shot, and his Stone Edge hit us hard. I used Fly again, but his full restore kept us from taking him down, and he finished us off. Samurott was able to finish it, but not without taking some damage. For Conkeldur, I sent in Unpheasant, and although we took massive damage off Stone Edge, we still won in two hits of Fly. Last was Mind Xiao, who outsped us to take down Unpheasant, and outsped Swanna to do lots of damage, but thankfully, our fly was able to get the one-shot on it. With the Elite Four down, all that's left is the final two fights with N and Getsis. I think I can beat N, but I've gotta say, I'm real skeptical about our chances against Getsis right now. N starts with his legendary Zekrom, and I have Exadrill start the fight. He has full restores to last longer, but he doesn't really have any great moves to deal with us, so we ended up taking him down with 78 health to spare. Out to Swan to deal with Zekrom since it's always pretending to be Kling Clang. We nearly fainted to a couple of Night Slashes, but still got the knockout. For his real Kling Clang, I tried having Swanna use Surf, but he outsped us and used Thunderbolt. I sent Exadrill back into Brute Force it. We didn't deal much damage, but neither did he, and he was using Hyper Beam so he'd miss turns. Thanks to that and a crit, we got the knockout with 8 health left. Caracosta was next, and it's part rock so I sent in Samurott to use Surf. It did way more damage than I was expecting, so we actually two-shot it easily. Next was his Archeops, so naturally we just used Surf. We got a one-shot, but not before almost going down. Last was Vanillax, and it outsped us, so down went Samurott. Out to Exadrill to hit Strength before it finished it off too. Then we sent in Unpheasant to use Fly. We took it to a sliver, it's Blizzard missed, and then we hit Fly again to get the win. After having to faint and come back so that we didn't start the battle with Exadrill, it's time for the final boss, Getsis. First is Kafagrigus, who naturally hit us with Toxic, then tried to stall with Protect. He also used Shadow Ball and a full restore, so by the time he fainted, we fainted from Poison. I sent in Archeops to deal with the Buffalant, and we did pretty good damage, but his Wild Charge did a ton. Thanks to our stat drop from having low health, we couldn't finish him off and fainted. I had to use Unpheasant to take him down. This isn't a good start. 
But sharp is next, and next drill is our only real choice, so we just traded shots for ages. We hardly won with almost no health left. Next was Hydragon, and this is where it fell apart. It's super fast, and hits incredibly hard with Dragon Pulse. He took out two of our Pokémon before we could finish it with Exadrill, and as soon as Seismitoad came out, he finished it off. Not even close to a win. Okay, so it's back to the grind. So here's the problem with the Getsus fight. He has pretty much the perfect moves to counter us. His entire team other than Bisharp and Kofagrigus have super effective moves against Exadrill, but Exadrill can't hit Kofagrigus, so we can only really use him against Bisharp, a Pokémon that he really isn't that good at against anyway. Buffalant and Electros both have super effective moves against our Flying types and Samurott because of their electric moves, and Seismitoad's Muddy Water is good against Archeops. We're not super effective against any of his team, many of them are overall stronger than us due to better moves, and he seems to always send out Electros last, who's debatably his most dangerous Pokémon with his moveset. He's got Wild Charge for an electric move, and Flamethrower as a fire move, so he's super effective against literally our entire team. Plus, Electric resists flying, so overpowering him with fly is unlikely. We don't really have any choice other than to grind a bunch and try and get stronger than them. If we can at least get faster, then that should help. Oh, and Kofagrigus has Protect, so we can't use Fly against him, he'll block us every time. That leaves Swanna and Samurott to use Surf, and since he has Toxic, that means that it's pretty much guaranteed that we lose one of the two right at the start of the fight. This is brutal. Okay, next try after grinding the team up to level 60. This time we still get hit by Toxic right away, but at least we took him out way faster, so Samurott survived with quite a bit of health. Bufflant was still a problem, but Unpheasant was able to take it down without any of our team fainting, so this is a much better start. For Bisharp, we still just have to use Exadrill, but this time we actually fainted, so I had to send in Samurott to finish it off with Surf, taking poison damage in the process. He was sending an Electros next, so I sent in Archeops to lead the charge. We did decent damage and actually got close to knocking him out thanks to his recoil damage, but we still fainted and had to send in Unpheasant to finish it off. Once again though, Hydreigon just came in and swept the entire rest of our team. That thing is a monster, and we need to be even stronger. Alright, another 5 levels higher. This time Kofagrigus straight up never hit Toxic, so we got a no damage knockout right at the start. Bufflant went the same as last time with Unpheasant beating it, and Exadrill was able to take out Bisharp after trading shots for a while, with some decent health to spare. Hydragon came out earlier this time, so I sent in Unpheasant, and we're actually finally faster than it. Fly did some great damage, but we went down, so I sent in Exadrill to finish it, just to end up leaving it with a sliver, so we fainted to Surf. I should have used Archeops, I bet that would have gotten the knockout. Well, Archeops was able to make it faint, but I don't think I needed to lose Exadrill there. For Seismitoad, I sent in Samurott, who hit Surf, then he just used Rain Dance, so we hit another Surf for the knockout. Seeing as Rain Dance powers up water, I just stayed in for Electros, hit Surf for tons of damage, then he knocked himself out with Wild Charge. That was a much better attempt. Well, that run didn't at all go how I expected. For as hard as the start and the end were, I didn't really think that the middle of the run was going to be so fast. I really hope you guys like that run. The next challenge might take a couple of weeks, kind of depends on how my health is. I'm still not 100% yet. I'm really looking forward to it though. It's going to be my first ever Fallout 4 challenge, when I try Fallout 4 with only pipe weapons. I don't think it'll be too hard of a challenge, but it should be a fun one. Plus, with it being my first challenge in a game, I'll be making it extra long so I can go over the whole plot so that people who have never played the game before can still enjoy the video, just like I did with Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas and Elder Scrolls Oblivion and Elder Scrolls Skyrim. I've beaten Fallout 4 on survival difficulty without using power armor before, so I'm pretty confident that I can win this challenge, but it should still be a fun time. As always, I'm looking forward to your suggestions in the comments, in the challenge request section of my Discord channel, and on Twitter. Subscribe, ring the bell, stay tuned. Outro time! Uh, man, what do I talk about? <laughs> I guess probably everyone's just gonna ask about my health, right? 
Uh, it hasn't been super long since I did the voiceover for the previous challenge. In fact, I uh, did this challenge faster than I thought I would. And normally when I finish a challenge, I'm not really doing the voiceover until like early the next week, but I'm actually doing the voiceover the same day that I finished this challenge. Um, mostly because it went a little bit faster than I was expecting, and also because I have been well enough to work enough days in a row now that I'm really trying to get a lot done now in December um, before I start having bad body days again, because, you know, it's kind of inevitable. It happens sometimes, so I'm trying to stay really productive. That and I want a lot of time to work on this Fallout 4 run, because I think it's going to be a long one, because um, it's going to be one of those runs where I talk about... Uh, <laughs> everything, basically. You know, I'm going to be going over the whole plot of the game so that uh, people who haven't played it before can understand how it works and what it's all about in the order of events so you're not just totally lost. Um, but that does mean it's a lot more work. So I want to make sure that I'm ready for that. Um, what, what else to talk about? Oh, I don't know if you heard, but Dwarf Fortress is getting a Steam version and it's coming out so soon, I think it's coming out like tomorrow or the day after or something. By the time you're watching this video, it'll already be out and I'm super excited because I used to play some Dwarf Fortress back in the day. I was never amazing at it, but that game is so much fun. I had a series uh, teaching people how to play it on this channel with my friend Truth, where he's uh, kind of teaching me how to play and by proxy teaching the audience how to play. Uh, but now that the Steam version is coming out, the game is going to be a lot more user friendly. It looks like it's straight up just the same game, except you can use a mouse <laughs> because actual old Dwarf Fortress was entirely ASCII art and you had to use the keyboard for everything. And really every menu was brutal and everything was under a category you didn't think it was going to be in. And uh, that whole game was a, a mess, an incredibly fun mess but a, a bit of a mess. And it seems like the Steam version is straight up the same thing, but the menus are easier to use and there's like graphics. You don't need to download a tile set. There's a built-in tile set that looks quite nice. It's basically just they kept the game the way it was, which is all I wanted, while giving you proper mouse support and whatnot, which is also all that we've ever wanted all of these years. I remember playing Dwarf Fortress a bit in high school, wishing it had some kind of mouse support. So I'm super pumped for that to come out. I mean, it's out now, so but by the time you guys are watching, it's out. So for all you guys know, with hindsight and everything, maybe the Steam release was a big disaster. But me, uh, past MDB, where it hasn't come out yet, I'm super excited for that, so that's gonna be a fun time. Maybe I'll even stream it? I wouldn't mind doing some streams of that, you know, as long as I'm feeling well enough to stream and I have time and everything. Uh, we'll see how things go. I do want to stream a lot more and do a lot more Let's Play stuff, but again, I gotta take things a little bit slowly because, uh, you know, health problems and all that, you guys already know all about that. And I'm still waiting on that MRI because the update has been that I am not getting my MRI until the 8th of January. So that's um, a little bit more than a month away from, from the time that I'm speaking into this microphone. So uh, we just gotta hope that the MRI gets results back quickly and that it says exactly what's wrong with my spine so that we can, you know, have a real diagnosis after three months of waiting. It's gonna be over four months of waiting for a diagnosis. Uh, by the time I get this MRI. And uh, we just have to hope that that actually discovers all of the problems, because who knows? Maybe it won't. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get on editing this voiceover and then rest. Until next time, have a nice day.